when working with any sort of compounding, whether it's inflation rates, interest rates, etc., it's very important to understand the difference between a nominal and effective rate. So just to explain firstly what it means, if I'm told that I'm going to get 12% effective compounded monthly, if I create my little bucket, you'll see I start with 100 Rand, if I assume that that means 1%, what it means is in month one, we had 100 Rand, we get 1%, so that's 1 Rand. Now it's 101. In the second month, we've now got 101, which means that the interest we earn is 1 Rand and 1 cents. So at the end of this period, you discover that instead of earning the 12% effective that we thought, it's actually 112.68. This is because in the calculation, we shouldn't use the effective rate we should use the nominal rate. So we could play with this to work out what rate gets us to exactly 112. So we can do that, I suppose. Another way we could do it, if you know about goal seek, I could go to the goal seek and I say I want that cell there to equal to 112 by changing this cell here you'll see it works it out. Or better yet, it's to use what Excel has got built in to switch between effective and nominal rates. So what we're going to do then is over here we want to calculate what the number is. Now we have calculated it, but let's use... I'm going to say I want to work out what the nominal rate is. In Excel, you've got two functions. One's called nominal. And when I say OK, all I have to do is point at the effective rate. So in this case, I know it's 12%. So there's the effective rate there. And tell it how many periods in this compounding. I'm going to say 12. It gives me a number. Let's just convert it to a percentage. And I know that that's the nominal rate. So what I should do is take the nominal rate, divide by 12, and you'll see that now compounded monthly ends up with the correct number. The other function for this is the effective rate. So if someone tells you the nominal rate, like that one here, there's a function in Excel called effect for effective. And what it does is that I can point at a nominal rate, tell it the number of periods, and it will then calculate with compounding what does it effectively mean. So effectively this nominal rate will give you that much effectively at the end of the period. Let's see why that's important. If I've got this example here, what I have is I have got a whole bunch of costs and I'm told that inflation is an effective rate of 6%. Now inflation could be measured in two ways. So either you have costs that stay the same and then at the end of the year they jump up. Or you can have costs that just steadily climb up monthly. Either way, however, if we're saying inflation is effectively 6%, an amount that starts at 1, both methods must end up at 1.06. So let's see if we take this. I'm just going to go divide this by 12 and I'm going to say take the price and multiply it by 1 plus our monthly charge. Let's see if we get the same number and you'll see what it does is because we've used the incorrect starting point when we use this method the cost is 1.0617 here it's 1.06 and these should be the same. The reason this is not working out is because this is an effective rate but we're now calculating it monthly so we need to convert it into a monthly rate or a nominal rate. So that's when I can use my nominal function. I'm going to say that's the effective rate. How many periods? 12 gives me a percentage. Remember I need to divide this by 12 because of the way I'm using it here. 
And what you'll see now is it doesn't matter whether we use a step up approach where costs stay the same for a full year and then jump or we go monthly we end up on exactly the same number and this is very important especially when you go out further because keep in mind if you're not careful and you're going out 60 120 months this gap can be quite wide debt calculations are commonly required in financial models or budgets and forecasts first thing we're going to do is just go through and show that everything your financial calculator can do, Excel can do. So what we've got here is a, a debt profile. We've got a present value or the loan amount of 100,000. We're going to use a 12% nominal interest rate over 12 months. There's a payment of 57 because there's a future value or bullet residual value of 40,000. Given any four of these five items, you should always be able to work out the fifth. So for example, if we're given the, this bit of information and we want to know how much the loan was, there's a function in Excel called PV, which means present value. The way it works, it says what's the rate. What's important by the rate is you'll see it says it's the interest rate per period. Because this is 12 months, I need to go here and divide by 12. How many periods are we referring to? It's the 12 months. What's the payment? That's what we've calculated. What's the future value? Now you need to be careful here. When I choose that future value, you'll see Excel saying that the answer is 29,000. That's because for this calculation to work, generally the payment, the sign on the payment is the same as the sign on the future value. So we've captured this as a positive 40,000, but we need to put a negative sign in front of it to give us negative 40,000, which then gives us the correct number, 100,000. Type is whether it's beginning of period or end of period. So if we leave it blank or put a zero, it assumes end of period, which is the more common one. When I say OK, you'll see it gives me 100,000. If we want to work at the rate, so now we're given these four items as information, we want to know what the interest rate charge was. There's a function in Excel called rate. And what that does, it asks for the number of periods. I'm going to point here. What was the payment? What's the present value? What's the future value? Don't forget, it's minus whatever that number is. The type is a zero. When I say OK, you'll see it tells us 1%. That's because that's the rate per period. We've got a 12-month period. So we need to times it by 12 to get our number. If we're given this information, now we want to work out how long will it take for this to turn into that by with these repayments and that interest rate. The function in Excel is called N per number of periods. And it's pretty much the same, the rate divided by 12, the payment, present value, future value is negative 40,000, the type is a zero, and you'll see it tells you 12 months, so it'll be 12 months to make that calculation work out. The most common calculation when it comes to debt is to work out what repayment will turn that into this. So the function in Excel is called PMT. What's the rate? It's this one here, but divide by 12. How long? What's the present value? The future value minus the 40,000. The type is zero. And when I say OK, it tells me that we need to repay 5,730. Finally, if we've got this information, we want to know what is the end in month 12 what are we going to have outstanding the function is called FV standing for future value and what it does is that's the rate don't forget to divide by 12 the number of periods is 12 payment is this present value is that type is 0 and notice it gives us minus 40,000 so it correctly gives us the correct sign 
if we need it to show it as a positive we then have to multiply it by minus one so this shows you that Excel can do any of these functions that your financial calculator can do it's generally important when you build debt calculations to work out how much is interest and how much is capital so there's a couple of ways to do this so firstly we're going to use a concept of a bucket and build an amortization table so you'll see here I've set it up, I've got an opening balance I need to do the interest charge so we're going to use these details here so I know that we're going to charge whatever the opening balance is multiplied by our interest rates Just put, so we're going to say the opening balance multiplied by the interest rate put my dollar signs on and remember it's monthly so I need to divide by 12 so that tells me there's going to be interest charge of a thousand what is the repayment we've already calculated it I'm just going to link to here closing balance then is just adding those up this adds up the opening balance is the closing balance so now I should be able to copy and paste these here and what you'll see is that each month the interest charge changes because the opening balance changes and we end up with our 40,000 if we want to work out how much is interest and how much is capital the capital portion of each payment will be the equivalent of what the repayment amount is per month less the interest charge per month that's the capital amount so you can see that using this method we can work out how much was interest and how much was capital there are however some special functions in Excel that can do this for you automatically so just to show you that we don't need to build this whole thing I'm going to actually go over here to month 6 so I want to know of the repayment of 5007 how much in that month was principal and you'll see there's a function in Excel called PPMT principal payment so I'm just going to go here find the PPMT what you'll see it asks very similar questions so what's the rate so I'm just going to use this here put my dollar signs in divide by 12 it then asks for the P or the period so it's no longer n per is over here so that n per is the 12 months so I can put that in this wants to know what period we're in so we can either type it in or better notice I've got a little header here and I'm gonna say look at that cell there so we're telling Excel tell me the principal payment in month 6 of a 12 month loan at this interest rate etc the present value is that number there and I put my dollar signs on future value don't forget minus that number there with the dollar signs if you go a little bit lower you can go to type I'm going to put a zero or I could have left it blank and push enter so you'll see without any other information it has come to the same number that we calculated with the amortization table so now I can copy it left and I can copy it right and so we can calculate how much of the repayment is capital in nature to work out the interest portion so we could do that minus this or there's a function in Excel called RPMT interest payment so again I'm gonna go and just start in the month six and it pretty much asks exactly the same things what's the interest rate that with dollar signs divide by 12 what period are we in I'm going to use this header up here what's the total loan period 12 months dollar signs present values the hundred thousand future values minus the forty thousand and the top is zero when I click enter You'll see it gives me 759 which is the same as what we worked out over here so again I'm gonna copy it across to see how much interest we're paying in each month based on, on an amortizing profile and if we add it up you'll see it comes to the what we expect the repayments per month to be there is another function in Excel called QM RPMT and QM Prints. It does quite a nice thing, except it has one small um, flaw. So let me just I'll explain that just now. So what I want to now know is in the first six months, 
how much principal do we pay so effectively add those up to get a number and how much interest now the problem with this particular function is it doesn't allow you to have a future value it assumes the future value must be zero so just to show you how it works I'm going to put a zero here and you'll see all these calculations have adapted themselves so that we've now got this breakdown so let's see how this one works so principal payment is called cumprints cumulative principal payments so if I search for it you'll see it's called cumprints pretty much the same thing what's the rate so that cell divided by 12 what's the total number of periods the 12 with the dollar signs what's the present value hundred thousand dollar signs what's the start period and what's the end period so we know it's going to be month one to month six so I'm going to type a one and the end will be a six and you have to go down so unlike the others where it allows you to leave this blank you have to go here and put a zero when I say OK, you'll see it says 48,507. So in the first six months, you're going to pay off 48,000 rands worth of principal. If I add this up, you'll discover it's the same number. For the second six months, I can do the same thing. So I'm just going to copy it across. And all I need to do here is now say the start period is month 7, the end is month 12. When I say OK, it gives me 51,000. If I add these two up, it should come back to the original amount. Same thing with interest payments. There's a function in Excel called cumRPMT, cumulative interest payment. Pretty much asks exactly the same thing. That interest rate divided by 12. How many periods? Don't forget your dollar signs. What's the present value? Start month one, end month six type 0 and you'll see it gives me 4801 let's work out see what interest we charged in the first six months 4801 and again I can copy and paste it here and change these to be from month 7 to 12 so for the year we've charged 6000 rands worth of interest so it can be a useful function but only if your future value is going to work to zero. Now we want to see how we can add some flexibility into these loans so that for example we can put extra money in, take extra money out. First thing I want to do is just get this back to be the original 40,000. Okay, so we've now got back to our original calculation. And I'm going to go over here. So what I want to show you is how mathematically we can calculate what the repayment has to be without looking into the past. So just if you look at the way we've set this up, we've got our same opening balance, we've done the calculation of interest, we need to work out the repayment. And just notice up here we've got a header but it goes backwards. It goes from 12 months, so what is he saying there's 12 months to go on this loan, there's 11 months, 10 months, etc. What I want to do is show you how you can set it up so that you can calculate what the repayment amount should be based on what the life left. So the first part is we go and we find our PMT function. What's the rate? So we're going to use our interest rate here, divide by 12. How many periods in this loan? So normally we'd go and say 12 months, but what we're going to now say is look at this header because each month it's going to be less and less. What's the present value? Well the present value when we're in month 11 is going to be a different outstanding balance. So I'm going to just refer to this cell here, no dollar signs. Future value in, we know it needs to be minus whatever's in there, put the dollar signs on, and type's going to be a zero. When I say OK it gives me 5731 which is the same as what we had up here. If I copy it across all the way, you'll see we get back to the 40,000. But what's interesting about this is let's go, for example, here. This is actually a calculation of an eighth month loan 
on 80,000 Rand to get to 40,000 Rand and you'll see it gives us the same amount. So if everything is exactly the same these numbers should be exactly the same. So why is this useful? Well what happens if over here we decide we need to take out another 50,000? So I'm going to put plus 50,000. You'll notice that this automatically changed the repayment amount so that we end up on the same number. And perhaps over here we pay back a lump sum of 30,000. Notice again the repayment changes so we end up in the exact same position. Because it's going to be important to work out what's interest and what's capital, we can still use PPMT and RPMT. So I'm going to go over here, let's sit there. We're going to work out the principal payment. So most of it's the same. PPMT, what's the rate? I'll just come up here and say it's that. Divide by 12. Let's just leave the period out. What's the number of periods? Now remember, we don't want to go and click on a static number. We're going to use our head up here. We're going to say there's eight months left in this loan. What's the present value? We're going to use this number up here. What's the future value minus 40,000 with the dollar sign? And what's the type? It's a zero. So the important thing here then is what is the period number? Now pre previously you would have looked up here and said it's period 5 but remember this is saying it's only an 8th month loan. So what period is this of an 8 month loan? Well it's going to be period 1. If I copy it here we're now going to have a 7 month loan. What period is that of a 7 month loan? It's also period 1. So we're actually going to hard code 1 in here. So when I say OK you'll see it gives me the exact same number of the capital portion. When I copy it across you'll see that it always matches up even though we've got places where we suddenly put money in and take money out. Exact same logic with RPMT with regards to interest. So it's RPMT, what's the rate 12% divided by 12. What's the period? We now know it must be a 1 because the number of periods is declining. Present values are opening balance. Future values minus the 40,000 with dollar signs. Type is 0. When I say OK, 1308, 1308. So I can copy these across. like that and you'll see it matches up. One of the key assumptions in all our other examples was that interest rates stayed the same. But interest is the one thing that probably moves a lot and can continue to move. So we want to set this up so that interest rates can change. So what we've got, you'll see we've set up our bucket. That's the opening balance. That sums it. So the first thing we need to do for this amortization table is work out the interest charge so we know it's the opening balance multiplied by, instead of now clicking on a static figure, we're going to click on this cell here because as we copied across we wanted to use that interest rate, monthly interest rate. I'm just going to divide by 12. So that gives us interest. What's the repayment? I'm going to go work out my PMT function. Now the rate again normally we'd go click on a single rate but I'm going to say look at this rate here no dollar signs and divide by 12. How many periods in this loan? So using what we learned previously I'm going to look at this declining number of months so there's 12 months left. What's the present value? I'm going to use the opening balance. Future value so I want it so I'm going to just put a minus sign link it to our 40,000 here with the dollar signs. Top is a zero and when I say OK you'll see it gives me the same number 5731 as all the other ones. If I copy this and just copy it all the way to here you'll see up to there exactly the same. 
let's just do the interest calcs here. Now we've got a change in interest. So let's see what happens if I go and I copy it. So you can see the repayment has dropped. And let's copy it all the way to the end and see if we hit our 40,000. And you'll see that despite the interest rate changing, it has gone and hit 40,000. What's quite nice about this is we could then change all of these on a regular basis and the calculations will work out as such that will always get back to the amount we expect. So let's say that's 11%, let's change it to 10% over here. So notice numbers change, we're back at 40,000, 9%, 8%, 7%, 6%. So you can see that this calculation changes the repayments so that we the loan ends up where it should be in the correct time period. With regards to PPMT and IPMT, same thing applies. So let's go over here. We're going to use our PPMT. What's the rate? So now instead of clicking on a static number, we're going to say click there, divide by 12. What period number? We're going to use a 1. How many periods are in the loan? Whatever's in that cell there. Present value, this number here. Future value, minus our 40,000. Type, zero. Let's say OK. If I copy it across, you'll see it's matching up exactly. We can do the same thing for the RPMT. So I could redo all of that, but the reality, they're so similar. I'm going to copy that formula, paste it here, and just change this from P to I. You'll see 808 matches that 808. And I can paste it. So what we've now got is a very flexible amortization table. We can play with the interest rates. And because we've built it, assuming that wherever we are, that's the only period left, I can put money in and take money out. So let's say over here, I'm going to take out another 50,000. You'll see we still end up with the 40,000. It just adjusts the repayment. Over here somewhere, we get our 50,000 back. Oops, that was too much. So let's make it 30,000. And you'll see it adjusts the repayment so that we end up at exactly the number we want. In this example, you need to use the basics of the loan structure to create an amortization table. Notice that we've got the opening balance and we've got a separate line for the drawdown. The solution for this example, first thing we need to work out is what is the repayment per month required. So for that we're going to use the PMT function. What's the rate? So that one over there, don't forget to divide by 12. What's the period of the loan? It's over there. What's the present value? It's over there. We're not given a future value, so we can assume we're getting to zero. What's the type? I'm going to assume it's end of period. So when I say OK, we've got a number there, 4,600. In this cell here, we're going to create an opening balance. So what we need to do for now, we could do either equals to that cell or I'm going to put a zero there. We've drawn down 100,000. We need to work out what the interest charge is. So this is going to be equals to, I'm going to open a bracket. I'm going to say the opening balance plus any drawdown. Close brackets multiplied by my interest rate with dollar signs divided by 12. So that gives us the interest charge. The repayment amount, we've already calculated it. So I'm going to go equals to that cell. Put the dollar signs on. 
So that's the closing balance. The opening balance we know for buckets we need to say equals to that one there. Be careful here, you can't copy that because remember we only draw it down once and that's why it's in blue, it's an input. I'm just going to highlight these two, put them here so it does the calculation and now I can highlight all of those. Go to the end of my 24 month period, paste it and you'll see you've got your interest charge, your repayments and at the end of 24 months, as we expect, it comes to zero. In this example, we want to create a debt amortization schedule. Different from our other examples, we're going to do the interest charge, but we now want to differentiate the portion to repay interest and the portion to repay capital. So you need to use the same logic but now we want to split it. The solution for this example so firstly we're told in F16 we need to show how much interest is being repaid. Now as a general rule if we charge that much interest you need to repay that much interest so I'm going to say equals minus whatever that number is Okay, so we know that if we charge interest that's how much gets repaid just going to copy and paste it. Then in order to calculate the scheduled capital repayment we need to know how much of our repayment is capital. We know the repayments here so I'm just going to do it a separate little calculation here. So the interest portion we know is going to be that number there. So therefore the capital portion must be equals to what we expect our monthly repayment to be. Put my dollar signs on minus whatever the interest portion was. So that's how much is capital. Okay, so that's working like that. At the moment you'll see it's staying the same, that's because we haven't fixed the amortization table yet. How much in this month is capital? We can now say equals to that cell there and when we copy and paste this across you'll see now every month we get how much was charged, how much is repaid because of interest, how much is repaid because of capital. In this example we want to create the amortization table but this time we've got a drawdown. We want to allow for ad hoc repayments. So we must be able to put a number in that repays a big chunk of the debt and it must automatically calculate what must happen to the repayments so that we get back to zero in the correct time period. The solution for this example, we've already got a header that goes forward 1 to 24. Per the instructions we now need this one to go backwards. So I'm going to say that must be life or the period of the loan and this must be equals to that cell minus one. So when I copy it and paste it we know how many months are left in the loan. The next thing we need to then work out is what is the capital portion of the loan based on the remaining life. I'm going to use the PPMT function, so the principal payment function. So what is the rate we need to use? You'll see we've got the interest rate up here, I'm going to use that and divide it by 12. How many periods left in the loan? I'm going to use the countdown that we created. What's the, sorry that's a mistake, that should be period 1 number of periods is how many periods are left, no dollar signs. What's the present value? I'm going to say, just put in brackets, it's that plus this. Future value, I'm going to put zero because we want to get it to zero, type zero. So when I say okay, 
we're now given what the principal payment needs to be. It's going to go this way. Okay. We're then going to go and link up the amortization table because we now know that the scheduled capital repayment should be that. I should be able to copy it across. Okay, so so far so good. And you'll see we've got a repayment amount, same amount. The benefit of this is now we've got the ad hoc payments. So if someone comes here and says actually I'm going to pay 40,000 early, immediately that adjusts, the repayment amount adjusts, and we end up with a zero. So we can actually go and maybe make a few more payments. And you'll see we end up in zero. And this ad hoc could even be a withdrawal. So let's take out 20,000 here. You'll see it has to adjust itself. You now have to go back to paying a little bit more. You get back to zero. In this example now, we want to create an amortization table, but we want to allow for interest and capital repayment holidays. So even though this loan is taken out, for the first two months we don't have to pay interest. So we need to calculate what, how long will it take to repay this, given that we've got some holidays. The solution for this example so what we're told is there's an interest repayment, but the repayments only start after whatever is written in here. So I'm going to build the if function. And I'm going to say if the month we're in over here, the header, is bigger than whatever's in here. Put my dollar signs on. If that's true, then just be minus whatever the charge is. If, however, it's false, I just want a zero. So when I say OK, you'll see it's got zero, no repayments. When I copy it across, so you'll see you've got zeros, and then it just repays whatever the interest charge is. We have, to have done the interest capital split here. So for the scheduled capital repayments, we're now told we only start paying capital in month after month three. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to have an if function. I'm going to say, look, is the cell over here bigger than whatever is written here? Dollar signs. If it's true, take whatever you see down there. If it's false, put a zero. When I say OK, I can now copy it across. And what you'll see now is even though we've got a holiday, interest holiday, and a capital repayment holiday, it's correctly showing what has to happen. But you'll see that at the end of the 24 month period, we're back at zero. So if we change this to zero, zero, this is just our normal loan, gets us back to zero. But we can maybe have a six month no capital payment, just match the interest. And you'll see it gets back to the zero. In this example, we want to allow for an interest and capital repayment holiday. The only difference here is when this interest holiday comes to an end, so in month three, so we don't pay any interest here. The payment here must first catch up all the interest charged to date and then continue as normal. Solution for this example, so what we need is at a point in time we need to catch up any outstanding interest charges and then continue from there. It's always a good idea to start the formula close to where you know the situation is. So we've got an interest holiday of three, which means that we're not going to pay there, there or there. But over here we expect to pay these four months and then move on. So we're going to build an if function, so the first part 
is fine. We can do an if function. And we're going to say, is the cell we're in equal to, or the period we're in equal to, our interest holiday plus one? You'll see we've put dollar signs in there. If it is, then I think we must just take any interest charge. So I'm going to do this. Okay, but the important thing here is I'm going to tell it it must always start at F15, put my dollar signs in, and it must continue for as far as we go. So if we change this, it will move on. If it's false, for now I'm just going to put zero. I just want to see what happens there. So I'm going to say equals. So that looks about right. We need to put a negative sign in. So I'm going to put a negative sign. If I go to the left, okay, you'll see it gives me zero, so I expect that. If I go to the right, okay, you can see that's zeros. I don't really want that. I actually need this. Once we go past the holiday, it must now just match the interest. So this zero here is a problem. We need to build another if in in this case. So what we're going to say over here is I'm going to say if the cell we're in or the month we're in is bigger than whatever you see here plus the one then please be minus whatever the interest charge is otherwise zero. We should be able to close it so let's go to the left. Okay, so that's still working out correctly. Let's go to the right. Okay, again, we shouldn't have put a minus in there because we've already got the minus here. So let's see. Okay, so that's looking okay. So I'm going to copy it all the way across. So it looks like it's working out. In the first month after the holiday, we make a big payment to catch up. You'll see we go to back to the 100,000. Now what we should be able to do is the capital repayment should simply be equals to our calculation over here. I should be able to copy and paste. Okay. What we haven't taken into account here is that we've got a capital holiday, so we can only start repaying from month five. So what I'm going to say is put another if in here. So if this here is bigger than whatever's in there, look down at the capital portion, otherwise put a zero, copy and paste it. And what you'll see now is we have a calculation which allows us at a point where the capital rep the interest repayment must be caught up, it catches up. We get back to our starting value and then we repay and we get back exactly to what we expect to be and we can if we need to change interest rates and make ad hoc withdrawals or payments. In this example we've got an annual model so these are years. We want to work out what the interest charge and repaid will be. Here we have calculated it in the wrong way. So what you'll see is we've got our table, we've got a drawdown. Our interest charge assumes that we get charged interest for a full year. The repayment is just offsetting it. And we've then done a PMT calculation to work out what that must be to get us back to the number we expect. Notice in the wrong way we don't get back to zero. What you need to do is calculate this correctly so that we get the correct interest charge given that we're making monthly repayments. So it's not a case of owing that much for the full 12 months. It's going to be declining. The solution for this example, notice we've given up here what the start month and end month is. This should give you a clue what we need to work out is what was the interest charged during this year but we know that during the year we made monthly payments so it cannot be opening balance times the percentage so the function to use here is the QM RPMT 
what's the interest rate? It's going to be this dollar signs divided by 12. What's the total period of the loan? Well, that is dollar signs. What's the present value? I'm going to do the drawdown amount here. What's the start period? I'm going to say look at that cell there. What's the end period? Look at that cell there. And what type of loan we're going to put to zero. So when I say OK, it tells us where here we said there was a charge of 110. Here we seem to have 102. It is a negative sign, so I'm just going to convert it because this is what we're saying we're charging. I can copy that across. How much is repaid of interest? I'm going to say equals minus whatever's in there. Okay. How much was repaid of the capital? So I'm going to use now the cum prints for cumulative principal. What's the rate? It's this divided by 12. Number of periods. That's all. Put the dollar signs on. Present value is this amount here. Probably should more correctly use that one there. Start period, use that cell. End period, use that cell. Top zero. When I say OK, it's 159. When I copy it across, you'll see now you have a significantly more accurate calculation. So he has the actual interest charge, he has the actual capital paid, and we get our closing balance back to be zero. Notice that the total repayment amounts are exactly the same. So the issue here is not that you will get your cash flows wrong. The issue here is that the interest charges differ quite significantly, which will then affect your tax. In this example, we've got a negative effective interest rate. It could be a negative growth rate. What we want to do is get the calculations to move correctly so that after 12 months it drops by effectively that number there. Normally when we want to do a table like this we need to turn an effective rate into a nominal rate. So in Excel we can use our nominal function. You'll see I can say I'm going to point at the effective rate going to tell it it's over 12 months. When I say OK however, it gives me an error. So nominal cannot handle a negative effective rate. So you're going to have to go back to your maths books. So what this will be is equals to 1 minus, I'm going to open two brackets, it's 1 plus that, just put the dollar signs on, to the power of 1 divided by 12, close it, so it tells us 0.51%, just to see how I would use it, I'm going to say equals to that multiplied by minus whatever the nominal rate is, dollar sign, so it gives us this, we've got a little bucket that then opening balance is the same as the closing balance. Let's see what happens at the end of our 12 month period. You'll see that the compounding results in it hitting exactly 94, which is exactly effectively a minus 6% growth, or in this case, a decline. The NPV function in Excel allows us to look at these cash flows and determine what their value is. So just in terms of components you need, you'll need obviously the, the model with our cash flows, a period zero and our various periods, and a discount rate. Now the one problem with NPV is if we go here and we find NPV, you'll see it asks for the rate, so that's easy enough, I'm going to point here then ask for the values, but it's very important to understand it's saying there's a whole bunch of values you can choose. Very important and must be equally spaced in time. So these must all be consistent. So you'll see there's a year between each and it's occurring at the end of each period. So you must be very careful when we're running an NPV using this function, 
We cannot do that. Because remember, this is period zero. It's happening at the beginning of the period. So it must be end of period. So if I highlight that, when I say OK, it gives me a number. But that's not actually the NPV because we haven't taken this into account. So when using the NPV function, similar to what we've done here, we're going to have to say what happened in initially. And so the actual NPV are these two items added together. Just to show you what would happen if we did make that mistake, so we're going to do an NPV, the rate's the 30%. If we accidentally do include that first reference, so when I say OK, you'll see it gives us a different number. And this is an incorrect number because the way NPV works is that the first thing it sees is at the end of the first period. So it assumes that's not actually happening now. It's happening at the end of period one. This then effectively is now happening at the end of period two, three, etc. So everything is one year out. Another function that exists in Excel is the X NPV function. And this addresses some of the concerns with the, the other NPV function. So in a similar way, we can go look for X NPV. And you'll see here what it asks. It says, give me the rate. So I'm going to use that one there. What are the values? And unlike NPV, in this case, we must include all the cash flows, including period zero. And the reason we can't do that is because when I go to, I've got an option called dates, and I can now specify by highlighting these dates exactly at what date did this happen. So the benefit of this tool is these don't have to be spaced equally. As long as you've given it the date, it doesn't really care whether they're the same or not. And you can include the first one because what Excel will do is look for the earliest date and that's the period it's going to work back to. So when I say OK, you'll see it gives me a number 9819. You'll see we don't have to make any sort of adjustments here. You'll notice as well it's slightly different answer from the original NPV calc. This is because this one is using exactly the number of days, whereas this is just assuming constant periods. Another way to calculate NPV in Excel is to actually do it manually. So what you'll see here, we've got our cash flows. And what I want to know is what is that amount worth in today's terms? And we're going to create a factor. Now to create a factor, you can either go and use your mathematical formula, or if you think about what it's doing, what we're saying is 8,700 in a year's time, what is it worth today? Well, guess what? There's a function in Excel called PV, which does exactly that. What is the present value of a number? So when I say OK, You'll see it asks the question. So the first one is, what's the rate? I'm going to use our 30%. How many periods? So I could type in one because I know it's period one. But I'm going to rather link it up to this header here because I want to be able to copy it across. What's the payment? Not relevant. What's the future value? We could go directly to this one. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a one in. So what I want to know is, what is one worth in today's terms? What's the type? I'm just going to put a zero. When I say OK, you'll see it immediately goes negative. Let's just increase the decimals. So I'm just going to get that to be a factor like that. Just must be careful here. I've just forgotten to put the dollar signs on this rate. So now what should happen is I can copy this across. And you'll see each of these is now giving us what that factor is for an amount of 1 two years later, three years later, four years later, etc. I can also do it for the current one because an amount zero years later just effectively ignores the discount. Now that we've got that, it's just a case of saying equals whatever the factor is multiplied by our cash flow. 
and I can copy and paste it and what you'll see is these numbers when you add them up 9805 9805 so this is a manual way of doing it the benefit of this way is you can actually see how important each year is by looking at these factors so it's quite nice in the sense that you can see that five years time for every dollar or rand it's only worth 27 cents so perhaps you should spend more time focusing on these numbers the other benefit is for something called mid-year discounting so what happens if we know that this money we're not going to receive at the end of the year we'll probably achieve it or receive it during the year so as an average I'm going to say we don't we receive it kind of halfway through the year on average so I'm going to put a 0.5 there you'll notice I've set the formulas up you had to immediately go 0.5 1.5 etc notice that immediately my factor changes my number changes and now suddenly these cash flows are worth 13,983 which is significantly more than the 9,805 because we are receiving our cash a full six months earlier every year. In order to calculate an IRR you can make use of the NPV function and goal seek at what discount rate the NPV becomes zero. So if we've got a cash flow setup and we've built an NPV either with NPV or XNPV an IRR is defined as the discount rate at which the NPV becomes zero so if we go to data what if analysis goal seek we can get Excel to search for the answer so we can say we want that cell over there to become a zero by changing this cell over here when I say OK, it runs through all the options and eventually finds a solution where it tells you that 50.57% will result in an NPV of zero. So that's the IRR of these particular cash flows. The IRR function in Excel allows you to determine the internal rate of return. The function itself is easy enough. We've got it over here, but I'll just recalculate it. So the function is called IRR. And you'll see all you need to do is tell it where the values are. Now for IRR, you have to have some outflows and some inflows. So we have to include period zero. I'm going to highlight all of those. And you can see it gives you the option of a guess. So this is just the IRR calculation is iterative. And occasionally, if the IRR is very different from what it expects, it may not get a solution. So you can put a guess in just to tell it to where it should start looking. But in this case, we don't need to. Just before we do that, what's important about this IRR is if you look at the definition, it's values. But just like the NPV, the assumption is that these are equally spaced in time. When I say OK, you'll see it gives me 51%. Let's just increase the decimals and you'll see it gives you 50.57 percent so what this means is that the IRR of these cash flows is 50.57 percent just to check it the IRR if used as a discount rate should make the NPV zero so I've just copied that I'm going to paste it as values and you'll see it gives you a zero I'm just going to say undo Similar to NPV, there's also an XIRR function in Excel, which we think is slightly better. So you'll see if we go and search for it, it's XIRR. And the only difference here is it asks for the values. So again, we highlight our cash flows. But, but now it asks for the dates. And if we highlight the dates, it's now going to work the IRR based on this value flowing on that date. We can put in a guess, so I'll put 0.1 or whatever we want to guess. When I say OK, it generates our percentage and you'll see in this case it's 50.62%. The benefit of XIRR 
is that you don't have to have these equally spaced in time. The time periods can be whatever they need to be. Excel will check the cash flow and the time period and work out what IRR will solve the NPV to zero. You'll notice that this IRR is slightly different from the, IRR, the other IRR calculation. The reason being this is very date specific, so it works out exactly the number of days in the years, whereas this one here is just assuming one year period, so they're all exactly the same. So there's a slight difference here. Let's just step back and have a look at what does the IRR actually mean. So what I've got here is there's our various calculations. I've just got an IRR proof here, just to make it easier to look at. I'm just going to hide these rows. So here's our cash flow. And what you'll see is we've obviously got our cash flows. That's the money that leaves us. This is the money that comes into us. What I've created here is a little bucket. So you'll see I've got an opening balance of zero. I've then pretended this is like me putting money into the bank. So I've taken 20,000 out of my pocket and put it into the bank. Here's the IRR calculation, which gave us the 50.57%. We've got our closing balance, which just adds those up. Next year's opening balance is that one closing balance. And then what we're doing is we're working out how much do we earn on the outstanding amount. So you'll see this 10,500 is taking the opening balance and growing it at our IRR. In terms of the cash we receive, all this is then doing is taking the money out in exactly the same way as the project would give it to us. And what you'll notice is that 50.57% ends up growing and paying out, growing and paying out, growing and paying out, such that in the last year, the last payment, the 18677, results in a zero. So theoretically now, if this was a bank account, the bank would now owe us nothing. They've paid us back our interest and our capital. And that's why IRR, it's quite useful to think about it as an investment in a bank account. Because this number tells us what would a bank have to pay us so that these profiles end up with a zero after the over the period we've built the IRR for. And this can be quite useful, especially for loan calculations where they are based on some sort of a set return, an expected IRR. You need to be a little bit careful with IRR as it has two slight problems. The first one is that, for example, this project here that returns 50%, the assumption is that if you take this 8,700 8, in cash, put it into another investment, IRR assumes that you'll achieve the same amount, which when the IRR is very hard, is probably unlikely. So there is another function in Excel called MIRR. We don't see it used much in the business world, but it's useful to know about. And the benefit of this one is it asks you at what rate do you get your money? So this 20,000, how much does it cost you in interest? And when you get money out, where are you going to put it? What return are you going to get? So we've assumed that we get our money and it's free, 0%. But when we put it and we reinvest it, the project can only achieve 11%, not the 50%. So if I go and find the MIRR, which stands for Modified Internal Rate of Return, To ask for the values, we need to highlight them all. It then says, what do you finance it at? I'm going to say 0%. What do you reinvest it at? 11%. When I say OK, I get a return of 32.23%. So there's quite a big difference between these IRRs. The difference here is that this one assumes that you can reinvest it at, in a project of similar return. Whereas this one then allows you to say, no, we'll get us a lower return. A more common recent trend when you are discounting to get a net present value of a cash flow is instead of using a constant discount rate, so for example, for these cash flows, perhaps we use 25% the whole time. 
what we do is we use multiple discount rates. The logic being that certain years are more risky than others. So for example, this is a construction project and the first two years are 25%, that's what we need. And then once it's constructed, it should be a little bit less risky. So you'll see it goes to 15 and then 12.5% once it's in steady state. The mistake we often see is people make use of these multiple discount rates, but the way they do it is they work out a discount factor. But what they're doing is they're treating it the traditional way. And you'll see the problem comes over here. So in terms of this formula, what it's saying is tell me what one three years time is worth at 15%. The problem is that's not the correct um, calculation because this 15% was preceded by two 25%. What this is effectively assuming is that was actually 25 and 25. And you can see it's a problem because look at the what this is saying. An amount of one in two years time is worth 64 cents but in three years time it's actually worth 66 cents so it's actually improved with time and that doesn't make sense. What this would mean is you'd rather have people give you money a year later to get the, the higher amount. The problem with this is that when you look and you use the PV factor to PV calculation to do the PV to do the factor, this 15% is assumed to be in all of those. So the correct way to do it is you have to modify the discount factor a bit. So we'll just go to this one here and you'll notice that in this calculation what we're doing is we're taking the previous year's amount and we're using only the one year factor. So here we've got a one, there what we're saying is Excel, tell me in only one year's time what is one worth in a year's time. The next one then instead of looking at the one it now says the future value is not a 1, but it's the 80 cents we calculated previously. The result of that is that this makes a lot more sense. Money in initially is worth 1, then a factor of 0 0.8, 0 0.64, 0 0.56, etc. And you can see the difference in total is significant. If we do this, all our cash inflows are coming in at a discount rate of 15% and lower. So it looks like this is a great project. But we haven't taken into account that we have to first go through two years of significant risk, 25% risk. And so the actual correct NPV is this 932, which is sort of two thirds of the initial value. Another important aspect of valuations is how we treat the terminal value. So if we have a project and we know we're going to spend that much and this is what we're going to get, it's highly unlikely that at that point everything stops. You probably have either some assets left over or you can sell the business or on the other side perhaps you've got some costs. So for example in a mine there might be environmental costs. The question is what do you do with this number? Now how you come up with a terminal value, there could be rules of thumb, so perhaps your business runs on a, can be sold on a 3 times EBITDA or an 8 times PE or something like that. Or you could use the Gordon Growth Model. Now the way the Gordon Growth Model works, it says take the previous year's cash flows, grow them, and then divide them by your discount rate less your growth rate. This number here is then calculated, but the big question is what then discount factor should we use? This is being calculated and I suppose you could say it's in period 6. But if you look at the calculation it says the price in 0 equals the division in 1. So this dividend in 1 sorry. So this number here is actually at point 0 which is actually period 5. So when you do these cash flows whatever your last discount factor was, that's what must be used to discount this back all the way to here. If you want to do it in one step, what you could do is then work this terminal value out and actually put it underneath here, 
add these two together and then multiply by that factor but it's very important to realize that this amount here is trying to value the future and it's valuing at the point in time at the beginning of year six or else the end of year five CAGR or compound annual growth rate is a popular measure in the business world what it's trying to work out or to tell us is how does a number turn from let's say sales of 10 million in year one to 17.5 million in year four what is the compound annual growth rate so what single percentage growth rate will turn 10 million into 17 and a half million in those years there's a couple of ways to do it unfortunately there is no CAGAR formula in Excel so the first way we can look at is how we can goal seek it and it provides a proof as well that we are getting it correct so what you'll see here is I've created a little bucket so this is the end of year so you'll see I've made that my closing balance there's my opening balance I've then seen it's going to grow by whatever that opening balance is times by our growth which is currently 0% and then that will add up so we know what we want to know is what single number here will turn a closing balance of 10 million into a closing balance of the 17.5 million so we're going to make use of our goal seek and we're going to ask Excel please make that cell over there equal to 17.5 million by changing the cell over here so when I say OK you'll see it runs through eventually gets a solution and it tells us that if it uses 20.51% each year that will grow from 10 million to 17 and a half million it's important to realize that what this is doing is not matching these middle years you'll see that it's suggesting we're going to be at 12.05 million we're actually at 12.5 here it's 14.5 but it's actually 15 the important thing is what single number will grow from this point to that point consistently and that's what CAGR is so you can use this to goal seek what the CAGR is Another way to calculate CAGR is to use the rate function because the rate function which is normally used when we're doing debt calculations is trying to work out what interest rate has a compounding effect on a set of numbers. So I'm going to go and find the rate function. Now there's a couple of things you've got to be careful of with the rate function when you're using it for CAGR firstly the number of periods is important as you'll see we've got four years here but the reality is this is the end of the year so actually from a compounding point of view we actually only have one two three so I'm gonna put a three in here the payments irrelevant because what we're saying is how are we going to get from 10 million to 17 and a half million and there's nothing happening in between we don't assume anything so we'll leave it blank the PV we're going to do the starting value so we'll use our 10 million the FV we're going to use our end value but we have to be careful here because as a rule of thumb the PV and the FV should have different signs remember for a debt point of view what we're saying is if we take out 10 million we have to pay back 17 and a half million what's the growth rate so here we just need to make one of them negative so I'm going to make the PV negative so now what we're asking Excel is tell me how you could get from minus 10 million in three years to 17 and a half million with no payments in between. Type we're going to just use put a zero there. When I say OK you'll see it gives me 20.51 percent and as we as we show here this 20.51 percent would then take a number like 10 million and by growing it each year and compounding it get us to the 17.5 million we can use 
the IRR function to calculate a KGAR. If you think about what KGAR is doing, it's saying how do we get from 10 million to 17 and a half million? The IRR function does a similar thing. How do we make one set of cash flows equate to another set of cash flows? In this case, we're going to just have to set up some helper cells. So firstly, I'm going to have to set up that this equals to that number there. Now IRR does need a negative to turn into a positive. So we're going to just make that a negative cell. We do know that it has to go through these periods. So I'm going to just put some zeros here. And the only point of that is just so that Excel knows that there's two periods in between. The last one is going to be where we want to get to. So we've now set up the cash flows. We're going to ask Excel what percentage compounded will take 10 million and turn it into 17 and a half million. So we can use the IRR function. And you'll see we just highlight values. When I say OK, it gives you 20.51%. So what that's telling you is that if you, and we've got the proof here, if we had 10 million here and we grew it at 20.51%, that same growth percentage on the opening balance will turn into 17.5 million. We can use the XRR function to work it out our KGAR. We just have to set up some cells just to help Excel out. So what we know is we want to turn 10 million into 17 and a half million. Now for IRR or XIRR, you cannot have two positive numbers. There has to at least be one negative, one positive. So I'm going to just make that one a negative. And because we're going to use the XIRR function, we need to give it dates. So I'm going to say this 10 million is going to be at that date. And this 17 million is going to be at that date. Now that we've set it up and we've got our cells, what we now can do is we can use the XRR function. Tell it where the values is, those two there. Tell it where the dates are those two there. And when I say OK, you'll see it gives me 20.49%. Now this is slightly different from our other KGARs and that's because this is a lot more accurate in the sense that it's working out exactly the number of days in these periods. Whereas our other KGARs, which we can prove here, are working out on just single years. In order to prove this one we'd then have to work out exactly the number of days per year. But XIRR is a very good way of showing how we can take one number and convert it into another number. And just by entering the dates between those two numbers, we'll get an accurate reflection of what the compound annual growth rate needs to be. In this example, we want to create a PE multiple calculator to see what we need to grow at to justify certain PEs, price earning ratios. So you'll see here what we've got is a calculation where you input the earnings per share and the price of the, the stock at a point in time. It calculates the resultant PE. We've got a set discount rate. We've then got our calculation. And what we want to do is for the first three years, we're going to have sort of the super normal growth. And then there's a steady state growth which then goes on and we've modeled for 50 years. This uses the opening earnings per share and then all it does is it predicts the earnings per share based on these growth figures. What we need to do is first work out what this means in today's terms. So we want to do a net present value of these various earnings based on this discount rate. And then we want to create a data table such that we can have the various terminal rates. So these are these here, the 6%. So what happens if this is 3%, 4%, etc.? 
and then the initial growth rates for the first three years use these so we can see what must the suggested price be on this particular share with these earnings so you can see whether it's a buy or sell. The solution for this example so the first thing we need to do is work out what the suggested price is. We need to do an NPV. So we're going to go and find the NPV. The rate to use, we've got it over here. The values, we don't use period zero, that's already gone. We're going to look at this one and go forward to the end of year 50. And when I say OK, you'll see that it suggests there's a suggested price of 316 but the actual price is currently 403. What we want to see is what does it imply based on a data table. So across the top I've got terminal growth which, which matches that input there. I've got initial growth which is that input there. We highlight this. We go data, what if analysis data table. The row is the terminal value, the column is the initial value. I click OK. Because it's giving me the same number, I'm going to push F9 so the data table works. Let's just make this a bit bigger so we can see all the numbers. So there's our set of numbers. You can now see that at the 6% and minus 10%, the suggested price is 316. If, for example, terminal growth is actually 9%, then it's 422. The next part of the example tries to make this a bit more clear because it's difficult to actually see these numbers. You have to look at every single cell. So we're going to make use of conditional formatting. So what we want to do is we want to look and see that these numbers, if they match or close to the suggested price, then we want that to be yellow. We want it to be green if it's less than that, opportunity for us to buy, or red if it's higher than that. So we go to home, conditional formatting. We're going to use color scales. Now if we use that one, the highest number is green. So we actually want to go the other way around. Switch that on. At the moment, Excel has guessed what it wants to, what should be green, yellow, and red. So I'm going to go and say manage rules. I'm going to say edit rule. And what we're going to say is the midpoint must not be based on a percentile. It must be a number. And that number you can find in this cell here. So when I say OK and apply, you'll see there's our yellow cell, the one that matches that. And the opportunities are in this direction. And if the price was in this area, it would be a definite cell. The next part is we want to add conditional formatting to show the numbers that are close to the actual price. So we'll say that within 10%, either up or down of that price. We're going to shade it, so I'm going to highlight that, go conditional formatting. You'll see if I go to highlight cell rules, there's an option here saying between. So I want to say that if the cells are between, and we're now going to put a formula in here, and we're going to say it's equals to that number times 0.9 or equals to C19 times 1.1. You can see it's already doing it, but we want to shade it. We don't want the colors to be interfered with. So we've got a custom format. I'm going to go to fill, and you'll see we've got a pattern style. So I'm going to choose one of these styles. And maybe to make it a little bit clearer, I'm going to add a border. So you can see already it's showing us the cells that are close to the current number. I'm going to say OK. So now what you've got is you've got the color scales and you've got the shading.
In this example, we want to build a retirement calculator and work out how much money we need to retire. So you'll see in the blue cells, we've got what the annual income is, how much savings we have, what inflation and return is, hence the net return, current age, desired age of retirement, age of death, and therefore how many years we need to plan retirement for, what percentage of income we'll need to use as a um, in our retirement and what percentage of your income is going to be saved per year and just what it equates to. You'll see we've set up most of it. So what year are we in? What's your age? Are we retired yet or not? So you'll see there are ones when we're not yet retired and when we hit the age of over 65 it turns to a zero. You'll see we've set up the calculation of what the annual income is currently and how it grows. And then down here, what it does is it converts to what does the annual income need to be once we retire and how much gets put into savings based on that. So you'll see these formulas are taking whatever the annual income is and our expected percentage. We've then got a calculation to work out our cumulative savings. So this is a sideways bucket. So you'll see there's an opening balance. There's how much we save. What you need to do is calculate the growth on the opening balance. So if we go down here, this 50,000 will be with us for the whole year. So we want to know what the return is on that based on this net return. And the growth on the current savings, because we put it away monthly, we're just going to halve it to mimic as if it's happening in the middle of the year. And we get the closing balance, which just adds all those up. We then want to know what our post-retirement income and expenses will be. So you'll see formulas have been set up so that at point of retirement, what we have is it looks to see how much do we have in savings. So it pulls the information from here, continues with the calculation. So it does the investment income. We then need to pull through the annual expenses, which need to be based on this percentage 80% so we only need 80% of our income and we get our closing balance to see what's happening on our retirement savings and you'll see it's been set up that when we go negative it just becomes a minus one. So more calculations and then what we've got here is a separate calculation which needs to then work out forget about the savings what do we need to be able to spend in our retirement and bring it back to today's terms bring, or not to today's terms at your retirement age terms so bring it back to that time to know what should your savings be at that point in time to handle that much expenses the solution for this example first thing we need to do is work out our growth on the opening balance. So what we're going to do is here is we're going to say equals whatever the opening balance is multiplied by our net return expected. Putting my dollar signs. I'm going to copy and paste it down. The second is the savings on our, the growth on our current savings, so how much we put in each year. So we're going to assume that it's evenly put in through the year. So we're going to say take the current savings, multiply it by expected return with the dollar signs on, but divided by 2. Copy and paste it all the way down. and our closing balance is already doing it correctly. What we then want to do is work out our annual expenses. Now annual expenses only when we're in retirement must we worry about it. So we're going to come here and build the formula here first. So what we're going to say is equals if So we're going to click on this cell here and say, is that cell bigger than zero? So it'll only happen when we're in retirement. 
if it is take whatever is in there multiply it with what we think we actually need given that we now retired otherwise put zero so what you'll see that's adding which is not what we want because these are expenses so I'm just going to put a negative sign in front there so that looks like it's working I'm just going to go one up that looks fine one down that looks fine so I'm then going to place it in here so now what we've got is while we're working we don't take it into account but once we retire we look at our savings we get our investment income and then we spend money out of it which then gives us a closing balance now that we know all of this you can see we've got a potential problem this amount of savings is a little bit short we eventually go negative so what we want to now work out is what should we have saved so you'll see we've set up this section there's a retirement calculate timing so when are we retired or when are we dead so you'll see we need to fund all those all this is doing is pulling through how much we need and we've just shown it as a positive number so how much do we require at this point in time so first I'm going to build it here then we'll allow for the flexibility so I know that if I need to fund all of these and I've got a return of 10% I can use a net present value what is the net present value of all these outflows how much do I need at 10% so that in the end we at at zero so this is a straightforward NPV calc the rate is the rate we would earn so I'm going to click on there and put my dollar signs in the value it must look from here to the end and because we we can let it continue like at that size but I'm going to just put dollar signs on the last part so that it's from wherever you are to the end when I say OK you'll see it gives me 37,239 so where we actually have 26 million we need to have 37 million so this is fine except every time I copy it it's then going to go and assume the full calculation we don't want that we want it to only appear here so we're going to build an if function around it and the function is going to be something like this if and that equals zero and that equals one close bracket so only at that point only where you see that we weren't retired and now we retired that's the only point you do your NPV otherwise just put a zero there let's go one up that's great one down that looks like it's working I can now paste it in so what you'll see now is it's telling us we should have had 37 million just that it's in a single cell and we don't have to search for it over here we've put a sum so it adds it all up We've got lots of zeros and then at that one point the number and now this has been built for you already that's telling us what we should have had this is telling us what we do have over here and that tells us how short we are in this example we've got a series of cash flows and instead of a single discount rate we've got a discount rate per year so the first two years are a bit more risky so we've got a high discount rate and then once it's set up it's a lot lower discount rate we cannot use an NPV or XNPV function here we have to use our discount factors but we need to get it correct so it takes this into account in order to create the discount factor we're going to use the PV function but we're just going to be a little bit careful it's slightly different so we're going to go find PV so what is the rate 
we're going to have it look up here. Now normally this would be a single rate, click with dollar signs, but that's not going to happen simply because we've now got a different discount rate per period. How many periods are we talking about? Normally you'd link it to the header, but in this case we need it to check itself every year. So we're going to always refer to only one year. Payments irrelevant. The future value is going to be the previous cell and the type is a zero. So what we're asking Excel is if we're standing here, take one, but tell me what it's worth in a year's time at 25%. When I say OK, I get 0.8. It's a negative. We don't want a negative. So I'm just going to put a positive in there. When I copy this across, you'll see that gives 0.64. What it's doing is it's taking the 0.8 and saying what is that worth at 25% in a year's time and I can copy all these across and what you'll see is then these are taking the cumulative effect of previous risky years and then taking the less risky years into account and we've already built it for you this just multiplies the two across the factor by the cash flow and that just adds it up to give us our NPV In this example, we want to calculate the cumulative annual growth rate of these cash flows. So we want to see how, what the cumulative annual growth rate is from here to here. And you need to calculate it in three different ways, using the rate function, using IRR, and using XIRR. And here we've got a little bit of a proof. And all this is going to be able to do is you should be able to, when you calculate this first one, if you are correct, this number here should come to 18677 and obviously this number here they should all give you the same answer this one a similar answer the solution to this example so the first thing we need to do is use the rate function so I'm going to go find the rate function the most difficult thing here is what is the number of periods. So we are seeing we're going from 87 to 18677. If you count, you need to count that movement as a 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so it's not 5 because you've got 5 years. It's 1, so it's up to 4. So there we're going to put in a 4. What's the payment? We don't have a payment. What's the present value? I need to put in a minus starting point. What's the future value? I need to put in our end point. So what we're asking Excel is over four years how do we get from a minus 8718 to a positive 18677 type I'm just going to put in a zero. When I say OK I get my percentage 20.98%. Let's just check the proof. There's our opening balance. It then grows by that percentage, there's a result in closing balance and if you see that then continues to grow until it hits 18677.3, 18677.3. So we know that the correct cumulative annual growth rate is this 20.98%. Now getting the same number using IRR, so first we need some helper cells. So over here we're going to say this is equals to minus the starting point. We know we want to end up at the end point and in between we're just going to put zeros. Now we have to put zeros if we leave them blank the RR will not necessarily handle it correctly. We can come here we now find the function IRR and all we need to do is point at those values and when I say OK you'll see it gives us the same answer so that's correct. Another way to calculate the CAGR CAGR is using XIRR. So now what we're going to do is we're going to set up the dates here. So I'm going to say the date to start is that date over there. The date to end is the last date. On this date what's our number? It's going to be equals to minus that number because IRRs need negatives and positives. 
what's the n number, it's that number over here. You can now set up our x IRR, point at the values, point at the dates, so and when you say OK, you'll see you get a slightly different number. That's because this is taking the actual number of days into account in the years, so leap years, etc., as opposed to this, which is just assuming a constant time period. In this example, we have a funder, and their interest requirement is an effective return. So they want a real return of 10%. We need to add inflation, so what they actually expect is a 16% return, and it's an after-tax return. So what you need to work out is firstly, what does it mean in terms of um, a return to be after-tax, so we need to get tax, add up for tax, turn it into a nominal interest rate. Then you'll see here, we make some assumptions on repayments. So this loan, we are going to pay it back. There are some ad hoc cash flows we're going to put in. What you then need to create is the bucket and what the bucket needs to do is use the return, get the repayments in there and the end result here in month 12 must be how much do we need to pay in a lump sum so they get their required return. The solution for this example, the first thing we need to get is what is the pre-tax effective interest rate. So here's the effective interest rate we want, here's the tax rate. What we need to know is what is the pre-tax effective rate. So it's equals to whatever our required return is, divided by 1 minus a tax rate. So it's telling us 22.22%. Let's just check. Take the pre-tax rate and multiply it by 1 minus our tax rate. Should get to 16%, exactly 16%. So that's what we need pre-tax. This is an effective interest rate. Because we're going to build a bucket, we have to make it a nominal interest rate. It's compounded monthly. So I'm going to go and find the function called nominal. And we're going to say that's the effective rate to be paid over 12 periods. Say OK. So the interest rate we're going to use is 20.24%. The bucket is partially built for us. So you'll see it's been set up. That's how much we're borrowing. So the required return or the interest rate that the bank requires is going to be this 20%. So the formula we're going to use here is going to be equals to, I'm going to just use brackets, the opening balance plus any drawdowns, multiplied by nominal interest rate, just put the dollar signs on, divide by 12. And I can copy this across. So if there weren't any payments, those are what the return should be. But we have received some payments. I'm just going to link to here. And copy it across. So what you'll see is that these repayments drop the closing balance a bit, which then affects the re required return. And what you can see is at the end of the 12 months, there's 108,000 outstanding. So in order to achieve this return, this last payment effectively needs to be minus whatever we owe at that point. So it's that plus that plus that. Close it. So there's the repayment. We now want to just check that this is correct, that when we use it, it comes to the correct IRR. So we've got to check cash flows. Now, the only thing you need to be careful of here is you cannot go, so what we need here is we need to show equals minus whatever's in there 
plus whatever's in there. So that part is fairly easy. So the cash flows, we have to make the payments to the bank. It looks like that. You may be tempted to also include this drawdown as a cash flow. But keep in mind that this cash flow, the way IRR and NPV works, this assumes the end of periods. And IRR needs a, a calculation to start with. So we're actually going to get rid of that. In order to get it work out, we need to tell it that this one is equals to minus the drawdown. So what we've now got is cash flows that we get a hundred thousand out, and then nothing. We get we pay back two five, nothing two five, etc. And eventually we have to pay the hundred eight thousand. You'll see the IRR is correct, but just be careful. If you did a straight IRR, we look at these values. you'll see it effectively gives you 1.69%. Remember that's 1.69% per period. This is monthly. So we have to make it effective. And the way we do that, we can go one plus whatever that cell is to the power of 12. And we subtract the one. And it then gives us a 22.22%. 22.22%. If you don't want to remember the mathematical formula, we can do it this way as well. We do the IRR, get the number. That's nominal per month. To make it nominal per year, we can multiply it by 12. So there's 20.24, should be familiar to you. It's that cell there. We still need to make it effective. So instead of doing the one plus calculation, we use the effect formula. That's all my nominal rate, comma number of periods, close the bracket, and it gets me to 22.22%. We highly recommend that when you do calculations like this, build in the checks. It's very easy to make a mistake, to forget your nominal or effective. So building in the check will make sure that your calculation actually works.